World War II ended 75 years ago. It was the darkest period of humankind. Even though just 20 years earlier World War I ended. A war to end all wars, supposedly. Yeah, that turned out well. The Seven Years War and Napoleonic Wars could also be labeled as world wars, in a sense. With so many wars throughout human history, it's quite possible we're just several international incidents, trade wars, civil wars or revolutions away from the next truly global conflict. So where could it start? Before we go into the possible hottest spots of the next world war, here's a little bit about the hottest warships around. Digital 3D ones, that is courtesy of Battle Warship, Naval Empire game, which is sponsoring this video. The game is free to play, with over 20 million mobile device downloads worldwide. You play as a commander, developing your naval base and building the most powerful naval fleet. There are over a hundred different types of aircraft carriers, as well as over 200 most advanced fighters, bombers and helicopters available in-game. This multiplayer game offers player v player battles, as well as guild v guild wars, where you fight alongside your friends in an alliance. There are massive enemy fleets to sink, pirates to beat and sea monsters to slay. Try the game now, in time to participate in Independence Day activities, where you have the opportunity to obtain super weapons and items, such as the Langley Carrier, Ohio Submarine, the Midway Carrier and the Z9 Helicopter. Install the game on your mobile device by clicking on the link below in the video description. World wars usually start out of smaller local wars. There are currently several locations around the world where such a hotspot might explode into a world war. One of those areas, the Arctic, we sort of covered in last week's video. So check that out too, the link is below in the video description. Anyway. Ukraine could, in theory, flare up once again. The pro-Russian separatists are currently dormant, but that may be due to lack of support for them from Russia. It's not impossible to imagine a situation where the entire Ukraine destabilizes, due to suspicious elections or an internal economic crisis exacerbated by the global crisis caused by the coronavirus event. If such destabilization happens, the lack of central government control might induce further separatist movements, not just the ones in the regions of Donetsk and Luhansk, controlled by existing separatist forces. Indeed, the two self-proclaimed republics of Donetsk and Luhansk claim a much larger territory that they control, and if the Ukrainian central government falls apart, they might seize the opportunity to try and expand. Russia's own response would be key, of course, and would decide whether such an event would remain a local war or would flare up into a larger incident. Russia has been feeling threatened by the US for some time. That feeling never really went away, of course, after the end of the Cold War. But ever since the events that happened in Ukraine in 2014, the relationship has been pretty bad. Various examples of political and economic pressure, like the US attempts to stop economic infrastructure cooperation between Russia and European countries, like with the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline, have only made the matters more tense. Just like Russia felt compelled to take Crimea in 2014, as it was fearing it would lose access to it for good, it's not out of the question that Russia would openly support the separatists once again, perhaps even to a greater degree than before. Once Russian forces do start operating inside Ukraine in massive numbers, rather than in covert formations like before, the line would get very blurry. Where might Russia stop with its incursion into Ukraine? Where might the West decide that enough is enough and send its own troops into Ukraine? And when armed forces from two sides are so close to each other, inside a country ravaged by fighting and civil war, incidents can very easily lead to catastrophe. One side might cause accidental deaths to the other side, for example. The other side might retaliate. Then all hell might break loose. A similar situation, again involving Russia, could flare up in the Baltic region. Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania are all NATO countries, but are very light on armed forces of their own. And NATO forces from other countries have regularly deployed there to help beef up their defenses. Any delicate situation between US and Russia anywhere else, like in the Arctic or in Ukraine, could lead to both sides accumulating forces in the Baltics. And Russia could again feel threatened if suddenly NATO start pouring troops anywhere close to Russia. 
the US was unwilling to let Soviets install missiles in Cuba back in 1962 at the US doorstep and was playing a game of chicken to see who'd blink first. They actually made the Soviets believe they would attack them if Soviet forces didn't leave Cuba. And even that was in reaction to NATO's own missile deployments near the Soviet Union in Turkey. So it's not unimaginable that Russia might do the same if too many NATO forces or specific missile weapon systems suddenly find their way to the Baltics. And the Baltics are not just the three mentioned NATO countries. Equally dangerous is the Baltic region of Kaliningrad, which has remained in Soviet and later Russian hands since World War II. Russia has been very protective of that region, which is heavily militarized for its size. It's basically the only permanent Russian access to the Baltic Sea, due to the winter period when maritime traffic around St. Petersburg requires constant icebreaker support. Of course, there is Poland, right next to Kaliningrad. And Poland has been one of the most trusted US allies in recent years, arguably more so than Germany or France. Poland is already seen by some as an alternate staging ground for a US army presence in Europe if Germany one day decides it doesn't want US troops there anymore. We're talking possibly tens of miles of distance between US and Russian forces then. NATO already doesn't like the Russian ballistic missiles stationed in the Kaliningrad region. And with the INF treaty basically falling apart, both sides are already developing platforms which may further exacerbate the situation. One wrong move and missiles may fly all over Europe. There's also the never-ending struggle between Pakistan and India. While there's been relative peace between them since the Kargil War of 1999, there have been armed incidents with loss of life in recent years. The two going to war is perhaps even more likely to cause a further world war than decades ago. Back then, their wars were seen as fairly isolated events. It was their own business. The Soviet Union and NATO had little immediate interest in using them as proxies. But today, India is a huge part of the global economy and Pakistan is a big part of the trade routes, both for the West but also for China. There are massive interests there that go way beyond just Pakistan and India. Pakistan has been one of China's oldest allies. And India is sort of aligning with the West but also playing with Russia and it doesn't seem to want to pick just one chair to sit on. It's not hard to imagine a situation where a simple border skirmish would lead to a war between India and Pakistan. And then, perhaps both the US and China selling arms to their side. Perhaps even China inserting its own forces to secure vital trade routes. And once one side does that, the gloves are off. China and the US are of course butting heads at an increasing rate. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that the world war might not start at some proxy location, but also right at the Chinese doorstep. There are two territories that are especially sensitive, the island of Taiwan and the Chinese-made islands in the South China Sea. Both are claimed by China and it doesn't seem as if China wants to let go of either. Taiwan is not under Chinese control though. Previously, US governments have sided with China and not really maintained official diplomatic relations with the country of Taiwan. But recently, US foreign policy changed as part of an overall approach to put pressure on China. The US did not sell many arms to Taiwan between the year 2000 and 2015, yet recently it started to do so again. So imagine if the US basically recognized Taiwan as an independent country and sold tons of weaponry, perhaps even held military exercises with the Taiwanese. And little by little, some of the US military presence could just remain on Taiwan itself. That might be done to provoke China, perhaps to do something as reckless as military action. If China does strike first, the US would likely be able to count on a broader coalition of countries uniting against China. China might feel cornered and very antsy, very protective of its claims. So it could feel so provoked that it actually does attack Taiwanese assets, in which case the US might very easily get dragged into war. Or it could be so tense that any US military asset near the borders gets shot at and the islands in the South China Sea would be the perfect ground for such a spark. The US doesn't approve of China taking control of rocks and reefs there, excavating earth and turning those reefs into proper islands and making bases on them. China has built up at least seven rocks into artificial islands in the Spratly Archipelago, three of which have sprawling military bases with runways. The US has been sailing close to those islands as it is. 
Now imagine all that going on or even increasing in frequency when there's a Taiwan crisis going on. The chances for one side's planes or ships to feel threatened would be immense. Accidents might occur. Warning shots might get fired and sooner or later someone might die, at which point the door to World War III might be wide open. Iran is another example of a country that might find itself in a proxy war between world powers. The US, as the recent years have shown, is pretty determined on not letting Iran trade with anyone. But what happens if US relations with other countries deteriorate as well? We've seen the US implementing partial sanctions on Russia and waging a trade war against China. If, for example, the economic war with China goes further, or goes so far that the US is basically not trading with China anymore, then what would be stopping China from trading with Iran? While the US will not be able to prevent other countries from trading with China, they might make an example of Iran. So if all else fails, there might be a military action against Iran. The pretense for that is plentiful as it is. Iran has been influencing the internal politics of Iraq. They've been shooting down some US aircraft and boarding British ships. And Iran is very much a part of the Syrian struggle, supporting Assad's military effort. The US could use any one of those as a pretext to strike. Let's face it, Iran has been on the US list for decades now. The strike might not even come from the US, though. If the internal politics of Iran change, perhaps even due to US economic pressure, Iran might indeed choose to continue its nuclear weapons program. If Iran does get on the verge of fielding nuclear-tipped missiles, Israel or Saudi Arabia might strike first. They have both been threatened by Iran before and feel threatened by a nuclear-armed Iran. So a strike on Iran's nuclear forces and installations as a preemptive measure is not out of the question. Such a strike could also very easily lead to total war, one that could very easily pour into Iraq due to its key location, and make the war in Syria even worse, possibly even dragging Turkey into everything. At that point, where Syria, a long-term Russian ally, is threatened, and where perhaps China and Russia feel threatened by a possible pro-Western regime change in Iran, playing against them, then China and Russia might openly support Iran. Again, all hell might break loose. North Korea was inevitable on a list like this. On its own, it's pretty insignificant. No world superpower really thinks it's worth the hassle to even try and cozy up to it. Which is why the status quo, the detachment from South Korea and world isolation, has been going on for decades. But when Kim Jong-un dies, there might be a power vacuum left behind. Imagine multiple internal parties fighting to succeed him, and the government crumbling. There could be a revolution, potentially even a civil war. The country also has nuclear weapons. Do the US and China stay put and just leave it be? Does South Korea, which has tens of millions of its people within missile reach, just let it play out? Or do the superpowers try to take advantage of the situation and try to influence the outcome of the power struggle? Because it's not unimportant who North Korea will align with in the future. The geography of North Korea means a lot to both the US and China. If the US could perhaps count on one day having its troops on current North Korean soil, let's say as part of unified Korea, then they would basically have a route towards Beijing. If China had control over North Korea, they would have easy access to the Sea of Japan, and thus easier access to both the Pacific and possibly access to US military assets stationed around Japan itself. So one superpower could send in secret weapons. The other side could infiltrate their own troops under disguise. Both could try and subvert the population to make them believe they are the true saviors. That can be done through various economic means, disguised as economic or even humanitarian aid. And before you know it, it could all escalate to name-calling between China and the US, to various combat air patrols over North Korea, so both sides can monitor that the other side isn't helping anyone. And ultimately such tensions could lead to unintentional skirmishes and war. As you can tell, pretty much all of these scenarios are dependent on one thing the existing bad relationship between superpowers. Without that, no proxy war could flare up into a world war. But if globalization is reversed, 
if international trade is limited, if nationalism rises, if the coronavirus crisis gets overly politicized and an iron curtain is once again raised, then there is no telling what bad things the future might bring. And remember, Binkov may talk about hypothetical wars, but only real peace can bring us all together.